The Queer No Girl History Project was founded in the summer of 2011 by activist and writer Darnell Moore, historian Burl Satter, and me, Christina Strasberger, administrator of history and African-American and African studies at Rutgers University, Newark. The Queer Newark Project exists to collect and preserve the voices and histories of Newark's LGBTQ plus and gender non-conforming communities in all its beauty, all its diversity, and all its power. The aims and goals of the project were shaped in earliest community meetings by the input of activists and artists who recognized a few key points. First, the city of Newark has a history of immense courage, creativity, and political activism among its queer residents. Second, that this complex and powerful history needs to be shared and preserved. Third, that the preservation of this history is immensely important as a resource, not only for queer Nork residents, but for all Nork residents, for historians, for artists, for activists of all sorts, on local, national, and international platforms. And that this mission was especially important since AIDS emaciated a generation and left the next generation of queer youth with few people to turn to for guidance and mentorship. Our project has been dedicated to queer youth. So when we were asked if we would like to contribute to Neutral Nation, this virtual art exhibit and experience dedicated to observing National Black HIV and AIDS Awareness Day, we immediately said yes. HIV and AIDS disproportionately affects communities of color. And through the interviews that we've conducted over the years, we know and continue to hear firsthand how devastating its impact has been. We will premiere our voices, our stories, a presentation featuring an interview with Aaron Frazier, poet and writer living with the virus, and Timothy Stewart Winter, historian and our co-director. Archival images from African American AIDS History Project and audio clips from a range of our interviews that include activists and pioneers like James Creedle and Gary Paul Wright, artists and advocates like Alicia Heath Toby, Mark Serdain, and the late Daryl Rochester. History is made through the living and the telling of our lives. It is made when we lift up our individual and collective voices. And our thanks to Travis Love and Research with a Heart for the invitation to collaborate, and to Rafael Cuello from Art Front Galleries for curating and hosting this art exhibit. And of course, our gratitude to all of you for tuning in to Neutral Nation, where no matter your status, everyone has a right to good health we are in this fight to combat HIV together. Thank you and stay safe. HIV and typecasting. There is no one type of person who is living with HIV. The people who have this experience are as diverse as we are. Fathers, brothers, grandfathers, artists, businessmen, sports stars, you name it. That's why we need to see and embrace the individual, make space for them to be as multidimensional and complex as everybody else. My introduction to Newark was uh, uh, really um, as a result of HIV AIDS. Uh, I, I don't know, some people may know that I was very actively involved with the Vietnam Veterans Movement. Uh, prior to getting involved with the uh, with the LGBT uh, gay and gay movement, and uh, at the time, um, I joined a group called. When I first became involved with uh, the gay movement, I joined a group called Men. Well, it was Black and White Men Together, and the reason I joined the group was because I found that when people, I was trying to get involved in New Jersey. But I found that it was mostly um, white male led and their agenda didn't fit with the kind of issue that had no concerns about the community. And since I was involved with the, uh, the uh, Vietnam Veterans Movement and was secretary for years to the National Association for Black Veterans, I spent a lot of time dealing with issues of racism and um, the experience that I got from trying to join the groups in New Jersey was they simply was not interest, interested in that. They were interested in gay rights as opposed to um, what I felt needed to be dealt with, and that was human rights. I think that's still an issue today. Uh, it's the contradiction that goes on in, in our community. In any case, uh, I joined um, Black and White Men Together because they were working on racism, sexism, homophobia, heterosexism, 
and anti uh, and HIV AIDS discrimination. So that fit well with a an agenda that um, I felt we need to, to to deal with. And from 1980 to uh, when the group started to 1990, I would go to New York every Friday night. And at the time, uh, I had just finished my 11-year relationship with Nick, and I was seeking to do other things. So for those. Ten years, I went to New York every, uh, every, almost every night, uh, every Friday night, and we discussed these issues in CR sessions. And I got to meet people like Bad Rustin and uh, Andrew Lord, and even James Baldwin, both of whom spoke to our group for the first time. The first time they spoke to a gay group was because of our work and because we wrote about the issues that we were dealing with. Uh, in our newsletter and we shared it with people like them because we wanted to invite them and wanted them to know of our work and they were our visionaries uh, and in fact the group and, and what we were about was modeled after a bridge called my back and it was issues of women of color talking about their experiences and we modeled our work around that kind of coming together um, and uh, in 1990, I was called, uh, MACT was called by uh, Patty Pendavis, uh, Pendalis, uh, Patty LaBelle, the House of LaBelle, because people were, uh, members of the house community, were sick and dying and not getting information about HIV AIDS prevention. And for me, I had been involved in a study group in New York because I was part of, of Men of All Colors since 1982. I had been involved in a study group around issues of behavior and what was happening in order to prevent HIV AIDS infection. And at that point, I said, it's time for me to go home. So I um, worked with uh, another person, Barbara Ford, to write a grant to the state to do HIV AIDS prevention and we target the house community. And that's when I became introduced to the gay community in Newark. Um, there weren't a whole lot of agencies, black agencies addressing HIV AIDS at the time. I mean, but it was also a time when the black community really, really started getting heavily infected. And it was like a time when we had to all sit back and go, oh shit, you know, <laughs> it really is happening and it's happening now. Um, so, you know, the minority AIDS, um, M M MT, minority, minority task force on AIDS, they were around. There were a couple of black uh, women's AIDS groups were being formed. Um, so it was, it was the late 80s, early 90s was really a time when the black community mm -hmm. like woke up and said, you know, this, this, is, this is real and it's happening to us. Um, so I actually wrote a, a workshop called uh, What's In It For Me? And he, I don't know, I must have told you all this story. I don't know, maybe I didn't. He was coming from New York and he could hardly stand up. And he said he <laughs> sat down, they had on a subway platforms, places or benches you could sit. And he sat down and he could, he could barely get up. And he continued that way, very weak. And it was he, soon after that, I don't know, maybe days, you know, I, I said, you got to go to the hospital, you got to go to the hospital. And he didn't even want to go to the hospital. And he was so weak, he could hardly stand up. And I had to struggle to get him in the car and took him to the hospital. And when it, we got to the hospital, you know, they didn't release him. He was, he was, he was in horrible shape. He had pipes and tubes all over him. Um, and it, I'm trying to remember what the doctor said, something about, something about his call puzzles, lack of white call puzzles or something, I don't know. T-cells, right? Like white T-cells or something? I, I, I don't know what it was. Mm -hmm. this, this was right at the beginning of the AIDS right, epidemic. It was, right, it, it, and it, it, a lot of people didn't even know a lot about exactly. it at that time, believe it or not. Right. Mm -hmm. um, that's right. And he, yeah, his health just, it went up and down a little it bit. It went up it really, and down a lot, actually. I don't think they had a whole lot of medications. They didn't right. really know a whole lot about how to handle the right. deal with AIDS at that time. Right. And he just got, what I remember is he was just like really weak all the time. Mm. It's not like he broke out with like, you know, lesions all over his body or anything well, like that. Well, he did eventually. eventually. Maybe, he did maybe at the very end. Yeah. Um, 
but it was mainly he was just like so weak. I remember shaving him one day. He was like so weak he couldn't even shave. So I just like sat him up in the bathroom and I shaved his face mm -hmm. for him because he just didn't even have enough strength to shave. Mm -hmm. So, But it was very, um, in, in the beginning, it, it was up and down. It was up and down. It was up um, and down, yeah. There and he stayed there for about a year, and he did well for a while. He was walking, he was writing us, you know, I'm walking three miles today. I'm, you know, um, and then you know because that's the way the disease is. Then he was not doing well, and he was near death. Um, they had given him, you know, days to live. When John called us, do you remember this? And I went to California to see him, and he was in the bed. You know, but you couldn't even, he had lost so much weight, you couldn't even see his body in the blankets. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I'm saying? He yeah. was that, you know, thin. Uh, you know, in the early days of AIDS, of course, I don't have to tell you guys this, but I mean, it, there was a lot of, you know, discrimination. There was a lot of, yeah. you know, you have to put fear. on a mask. Fear. There was a lot of fear. There was a lot of uh, judgment. You know, and you know, you got that from the medical community mm -hmm. when we would take him to his doctor's appointments mm -hmm. or go to visit him in the hospital. Mm -hmm. You know, you got that. And you know, people wanted to know if he was gay because they wanted mm -hmm. to know how he got AIDS. Mm -hmm. So you got that from the medical community. Mm -hmm. And then when the <coughs> epidemic came through, then we had so many of our family dying in the very early, early stages before it became um, the virus. It was just plain AIDS. Mm -hmm. And um, the education of how you contracted it and the education within the medical field was very early. We who have survived to 2014 mm -hmm. with or without the virus, mm -hmm. with or without AIDS, are fortunate because we all were, in 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 the gay term, yard dogs. Mm -hmm. You know, we were with this person and that person, and trying to be popular and mm -hmm. trying to have the 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 fiercest guy or the fiercest girl. Mm -hmm. uh, the element of family and the element of relationship was very heavy prior to the AIDS ec epidemic. After AIDS, people didn't want to trust anybody. They didn't know who they slept with. Uh, people were scared. So it broke. AIDS broke a lot of the... Uh, uh, automatic lifestyles that we were used and accustomed to. Okay, so AIDS broke family and relationships. Yes. Right. Broke uh, 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 random sex, mm -hmm. although, you know, it was rapid. But it stopped some people. Right. Um, so our lives changed. Mm -hmm. And rapidly because we lost so many at such a fast pace. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of uh, few tragic deaths around Newark. Yeah. It really was. And the worst for me was at the hands of Beth Israel Hospital. Yeah. Because you gotta realize back then when the AIDS epidemic started, they everybody assumed, you know, and assumed that, that if you were in the LGBT community mm. period that you had AIDS. Um, this girl named Teresa, I know, Maritha, she, um, she got sick, she went to the hospital, she went to Beth Israel, and they put an IV on her, and I don't know what kind of test they may or may not have done, but they stuck her in a room at the end of the hall next to... Here, I'll, I'll try to keep talking. Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll back on if you want to... Yeah, um... She... They put her in the room at the end of the hall next to the garbage dumpster and forgot about her. Her family was looking for her for over a week. 
and they called all the hospitals. They said they didn't have her. Um, they called the police stations. They called the county jails. And then they started doing a little publicity then with me. <laughs> they found her dead in their room. So it was like, okay, how do you admit somebody, put an IV in their arm, stick them in a room next to a garbage dumpster? To me, they just treated her like garbage. Yeah, I know, that's terrible. Oh my God. And she died there. Well. And they let her still sit there, not knowing. Because there's, oh, we thought she left. Wow, when, when was that? That was the 80s also, the early 80s. Wow. Yeah, a lot of trans women have, I don't, I don't know if I want to say a lot, but quite a few trans women have died from. Um, I became part of the HIV movement really here. Like I started in New York, but I, I came, I became part of that work. We, the church got funded to do preventions and so I was in it, mm -hmm. and so I could I could be in this city because I was doing mm -hmm. I was I was giving back and I was and this working. was through the church. This, this was through the church. Activism. Okay. Yep, this was through the church. It was important for us to create a space that the community could talk about the injustices that we were experiencing, mm -hmm. um, from you know again the murder of Sakia to the way that police um, responded to us in our community, mm -hmm. um, you know, the issue of homelessness, mm -hmm. of, so all of those things, it was important for us to create that space for for us to, to have those kinds of conversations mm -hmm. um, and safe right. for us. Um, and so I happened to be at that time, I, you know, I was part of the church. And so it was the natural, you know, we're social justice. Unity Fellowship Church mm -hmm. movement is a social justice movement. Um, it, it came out of the response to HIV and AIDS as it related to black and Latin men mm -hmm. um, in, in the early 80s. Because there was, there was no, first of all, there was no room in the black church mm -hmm. for someone living with HIV. Um, in fact, it was, um, you know, they were shunned and, they, you know, it was, was the, the, the thing was, this is a direct response to God's dislike mm -hmm. to homosexuality. Mm -hmm. So there was no place. And so that movement, that church movement became the place that responded to the injustices that black and Latin men mm -hmm. and brown men were experiencing. So it was the natural progression for us um, here in Newark, in the Newark Unity Fellowship Church, mm -hmm. which at the time was Liberation and Truth, mm -hmm. to, you know, that was that was part of our manifesto, right? And so we were committed mm -hmm. to standing for justice as it related to us mm -hmm. as, a, as a LGBT folk of color. Well, at that time, we were specifically addressing HIV and AIDS right. in our community as it was, as it related to men and women, mm -hmm. um, and we were addressing um, homophobia as it related to specifically mm -hmm. to this notion of of Christianity mm -hmm. um, and the black church and lesbians and gay men and trans folk. Um, and the violence against LGBT community. My journey started as clergy in that in that movement. In addition to that, we were um, many many years ago, like in '98, we were funded to provide HIV prevention in the city of Newark under another name called um, Loving and Truth. It was a prevention center. So the, the church was founded in 83 by a gentleman named Carl Bean, um, who now is 
the Archbishop of the Movement, but it came out of the need to provide spiritual and faith environment for men of color who were being ostracized from the church because they were HIV infected. Now, there are many more churches that are HIV, um, not HIV, um, LGBTQ affirming. HIV is not such a, you know, thing anymore. Um, but the one thing about the movement that is very unique is that it is unapologetically clear that God created us just as we are in our sexuality, our physicality, you know, and so that is a, that, and that message still is difficult for even some LGBT folks, be they in their churches or in mainstream churches. Um, and so that, yes, we can, and it's possible um, to be a healing space and a transformative space, that still is part of who we are. And so the story is about how the women were taking care of the men who were dying from HIV. Um, and that they can go into places and speak on their behalf in ways that another man could not because he was gay and he would be, you know what I mean? Um, and, and those stories stand out. And, and that's, but that's the history of women in the world. That's just what we do. Um, if we have the opportunity to do it and we, we do do that. Making the connection in between HIV and being lesbian was one of the most trying cha the ch challenge because there are the numbers don't say that a lesbians be can become infected, right? And so it was always a challenge, like to get funding for this project um, because the numbers didn't prove that lesbians were at risk for HIV. So a lot of the, you know, this paper was to say that's not the case. He, um, he was telling me that he, I had a post of Grace Jones that I always wanted. And it was signed, signed and everything. So he told me he would give me this poster. And he just started getting sick. And then I didn't know I didn't put it together while he was saying, get my shit together, you know, I hadn't put it together. This is the first time I've ever gotten emotional talking about Albert. Yeah, you, you really love him, yeah? Yeah. So, so that was it. That was his internal thing. He got sick and he passed on. And, um, the greatest tribute that I could give him was to do, do Blue. And this was before, you know, they, you know, knew anything about this disease. And next thing you know, he's in a hospital and you had to go ahead and put a gown on and gloves and surgeon masks. It was just horrific because they didn't know. They didn't have the treatments that they have today. And then next thing you know, Everybody started getting AIDS. And every turn around, one week this one was gone. The next week this one was gone, they were going. And I was very I was very fortunate. I I had brothers that I grew up with that I always watched them. They always had condoms. <laughs> <laughs> And their drawers, condoms, condoms, condoms. And Robert was the biggest sex fiend. And he would have condoms in his drawers. And I contribute that to my life because I always used condoms whenever I had sex. Hmm. This is Marvin in his heyday. I just can say is when it happened, it happened and it was swift. It was like a sheep. It was like a, 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 a thief in the night. It just robbed so many lives. It robbed so many lives. And you know when the, when the population really took heed to AIDS was when Rock Hudson. Mm -hmm. That's when the world opened up their eyes. Because one of their own great movie star 
had contracted this horrible disease. And it was like devastating to them because he was a heartthrob. Mm -hmm. What about Magic Johnson? Magic Johnson? Um, yeah, well, when he... That was later, obviously. That was later on, yeah. The, 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 the spoofing up, the, the horrific horror of it was all digested then. Got it. Let me tell you a story. When it hit me, I was getting dressed, and I wear, and I still do. I love it's a piece of garment that I have. It's a cape. It's a cloak, actually. And I love things that flow and long scarves and stuff like that in the winter. That's my favorite time. To like billow. I love it. It inspires me. It just tells me what I need to do. And I wore this cloak. And it's sharp. It's just like you can go out. You can wear this cloak and underneath have on a bathing suit or something. But you look like you're dressed. With a right hat, you look like you're dressed. It's over. It's over. Thank you. It's over. And I got on the bus and I sat down and this woman looked at me. And she looked again. And she looked again, and she got up and moved her seat. That's when the devastation hit me. People were frightened of people who were gay. They were, she was frightened, and it was clear why. It's of AIDS. My family again, I'm very fortunate. I have had three lovers who are HIV. I'm very fortunate again. Like I said, I always use condoms. That was my sex. That was my protector. And my friends used to laugh at me and say, why do you use condoms all the time? And that one, who's a deceased friend, <clears throat> says to me, you know what? <clears throat> That's why you're alive now. He's deceased. And I don't know if this is just that, if it's by the grace of God. It was just not my time, or it's not my time now. Now I, <clears throat> I take the prep. I take the prep. Um, and you know, and I also go every three months to be checked. And I'm very fortunate. I have done the same people, I'm sure. But I escaped it. And I'm healthy. <coughs> so. Do you have things you... What's next for Daryl? Mm, that's an interesting story. Hmm. I think something great is going to happen for me since I've moved here because this has given me an opportunity to do my own thing and I'm home, I'm home again. And so um, we've been really, really um, grateful to be able to uh, work with so many wonderful people in the field who are so passionate about HIV prevention and so people have very strong attitudes when they hear research and they have very strong narratives around HIV prevention and so when we, we come in the room with those two things in our hands it's, it's you know people um, a lot of times um, are not as open to hearing about the information so we have to we have to be able to be um, open enough to work with people who've been doing the work for so long, mm -hmm. you know. And then, could I ask, how did you get involved in all, all of this sort of AIDS research and prevention work in the first place? How did I get involved? That's a really good question. Um, when I had graduated from Montclair State University, I actually studied theater, and um, it was uh, me, I believe my 
junior or senior year, um, I learned that my mother was HIV positive, and uh, she kept it a secret for us for a, for a very long time. And I was um, I wanted to figure out, out how I could be involved in um, eliminating some of the stigma around HIV. Um, contributing to some solutions around prevention. And so that's the kind of things that I was interested in after that. Yeah. And so a lot of my work has also been um, infusing art, activism, and education around HIV prevention. Hi, um, my name is Tim Stewart Winter, and I'm here with Erin Frazier. Um, talking for African American AIDS Awareness Day. Erin is a, uh, a longtime friend of the Queer Newark Oral History Project and um, someone who has been uh, openly HIV positive and a long-term survivor. Um, do you wanna uh, maybe Erin tell us a little bit about the other roles that you play uh, just to sort of introduce yourself and set the stage? Okay, I um, <clears throat> I volunteer just about some of everywhere. Like on the third Saturday of the month, I help my cousin at her church with their food pantry. Each month is the third Saturday of each month, and go there and help out there. Um, then on the third Sunday, our church ministry do um, bag lunch. Uh, we make up. And we take it right around, giving it to the uh, homeless on the street. That's one. And then part of, being part of the uh, men's ministry is about uh, building uh, brothers up and building up the ministry and getting some other pro possible programs to help build the male component of the church a little bit better. And that church, that's Unity Fellowship? Community Fellowship Church North, yes. Elder Kevin E. Taylor is the pastor. The associate pastor is uh, Jerry Lee Mitchell. And you're a deacon. Yes. Um, yes, they asked me to come back and I did, I did. So you wear a lot of, uh, a lot of hats in the community, uh, in Newark and as a, an activist. Um, so a lot of my students might not know a lot about what it was like uh, to, to get the diagnosis of HIV um, in the 1980s. Um, you, you're a long-term survivor of, uh, of this virus. Um, can you tell us a little bit about um, just what, what it was like to get that diagnosis in the 1980s. It wasn't nice. Um, I can talk about my, my first time taking the test. I went to a specific hospital in Newark. Um, I was in a room at a desk and the woman came, you know, it was anonymous. They gave you a, a number instead of your name. And there was no compassion. It was like, you're positive and nothing else. So I left from there and then I went to my actual doctor and you know, he uh, diagnosed me as well. And, but he said, uh, he don't know how to treat it. He said, just take care of yourself and do the best that you can. And I stopped seeing them and then I switched to where I'm at currently. Um, since then, we're talking about well over 30 years that I've been at North Beth uh, Family Treatment Center, which has actually kept me busy, involved, and you know, just you know, help when help is needed. Um. So you've you've survived this this illness, but you've also witnessed many friends. Um, yes. Who passed. Um, what are there things you want to share about that lessons uh, or memories of those occasions? Um, I will say uh, shame and stigma was um, really 
involved there with people going to the doctor and getting that particular diagnosis, maybe not even having friends to even confide in about what they're dealing with. That was a lot back then. And specifically, I'll say for myself, because a lot of my friends pass. So I'm um, making new friends and they're going and a lot of them was younger than me. And I just didn't understand it. Um, the shame of getting a diagnosis shouldn't have been as negative as it was because the whole thing is, okay, you got it, man, you, you can be treated, you know, you can live with this. And that was what a lot of people didn't get back then. They didn't start getting that till I'm, I'm gonna say when I was uh, almost 25 years of uh, being positive, you know, because a lot of people, even though they were still passing on from uh, organ failure or some other complication, people were still moving on, but the shame was there. Um, I'm gonna say, um, oh God, what is that word? When you um, miss somebody, a lot of people dealing with uh, abandonment, um, so to speak. So, you know, you had a lot of that going on and people just not knowing how PTSD. to do it. Um, I want to say um, it's just, oh boy, just... Um, survivor's guilt survivor's guilt got it yes and that played I mean. a part. yeah it, 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 it um kind of was the individual condemning themselves because other people are gone and he's still there or she and don't have the same support system that they once had and encouragement so that was a, a large portion and then you know they realized you needed to be in a group so they started forming groups to share stories and help one another out of whatever the situation may be if they can because it, it is about self-sufficiency and being amongst your peers sharing your stories because your story may help somebody else my story may help somebody also and that was the importance of um the groups that they started forming. Some started um, kind of limiting their membership so that to keep the cohesion and uh, the bond of the group going. So um, most of that was like 10 at the most in a group. And those seemed to work out uh, pretty well and had a better outcome. So it's it's a groups of, of people who are living with HIV who are meeting on a regular basis? Correct. And is there a facilitator? How do these, how do guess, these groups come together? They, in the beginning, it was a facilitator. Then it started broadening, I would say in the early 90s towards mental health and including a facilitator and a, a mental health specialist that can see something with a particular client that maybe have to pull be pulled to the side and help them deal with whatever the issues are. Got it. Um, do you so so what do you think inspired you to be um, to be out about your diagnosis when so many people are not? I'm going to say I, did, I uh, dealt with uh, the blame game, the shame of being positive, the um, whole spectacle of the denial of it. Of course, for 12 years, I was in denial. I just was a workaholic going to work, not even dealing with it. And when I got laid off, that's when it was like, oh my God, you know, I'm thinking about what's going on. And that's when I started dealing with it. I had no choice, even to the point where my money's had ran out and bills didn't get paid. I had to make a choice of keeping the lights on or the phone on or the water off 
So, you know, it was that kind of issue, but the main thing to keep the phone on for communication purposes. Communication purposes, right. And so, um, and so then you, you, you made a change in your life. Um, this is, I guess, in the 90s. Correct. And, and this is also an era when the kind of treatment situation is changing. Had, yes, yes. They had more medicine, I'll say, at least um, seven to eight um, after the 90s. You know, and still building and condensing and doing all of that. So, did um, what difference did that make? How did the the new medications? For some, it, it was a difference of taking ten to twenty pills and taking maybe two or three. Wow, it's a big difference. Um, now, you've also been involved in research and studies of, um, of folks who've, who've lived with HIV for a long time. Yes, I actually uh, sit on uh, Rutgers Research uh, Cab in Newark. Um, and I've also, in my past, I was, uh, how do you say, I did, I did a job for the state of New Jersey and CDC far as uh, uh, consulting, uh, doing ethnography and uh, focus groups and things of that nature to get specific data for specific uh, demographics, whether it's male, female, gay, or otherwise. Um, you talked a little bit about, um, well, male, female, um, gay, not otherwise, um, since this is African American AIDS Awareness Day, uh, and and you know Newark is is one of the hardest hit cities in the United States. It's a predominantly Black city. Do you think? Uh, I don't know. What do you? What would you say to um, you know someone who's who's new to Newark? Maybe doesn't know very much about the impact that AIDS has had on um, Black communities over time? Um, <clears throat> I would just say it suggests to them to go to some of the groups. And that's where you get your first informational uh, situation from a uh, diverse group that you go to, whether it's male, mixed, or just for men or women, or MSM, things of that nature. You know, go where you can, where you feel comfortable and blend. You know, that was, you know, would be the thing to do. And as a person who has also facilitated groups, um, my thing, um, we, even though it was long-term survivors, we didn't deal with people who didn't have 20 or more years. And if they were newly diagnosed, diagnosed and they um, didn't know how to deal with it, um, nine times out of 10, me or the co-chair would uh, meet with this individual and kind of fill them out to see if they're ready for group dynamics, regardless of the age or whatever. Um, and that kind of worked for us because we had a few that just wasn't ready. They didn't know how to uh, interact in a group with other people and that other people matters outside of just them. That was a, um, a big issue. But for the most part, that group is still going on. Uh, hopefully we'll be, when this pandemic is a little bit better, we can uh, start meeting again. We have been communicating on phone or FaceTime, things of that nature, but everybody's anxious to do something now. Right. Um, and maybe that's a, a, a springboard to kind of talk about this pandemic, the coronavirus pandemic. Um, and well, I guess I'm curious, how, how has it affected those kinds of groups and networks? Depending on the, survivors? 
depending on the organization, if you have a rapport or they, you get your case management done there, some, I will say, have been uh, sympathetic in this situation. Um, others have even become more involved, you know, um, with helping out those in this situation. Um, one agency, um, even though it's not in Newark, um, offered, you know, Gabe was giving us $45 a month um, for, you know, a gift card to go buy food. Um, not too many people did that in Newark, you know, mm. and that is imperative to try to get some help along the way, especially if you have limited income and you don't have the resources. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and both of these pandemics are, um, are crises that have um, disproportionately, uh, have had disparate impacts, right? Yeah. Um, yes. This one is more... Color. This one is more scary because you don't know enough about the disease itself. You don't even, even with the preventive measures and uh, methods that they're talking about, it's not 100. You know, so you're still in, you know, leaving out with a prayer and doing what you can do to protect yourself while you're out here. Because this is crazy. You, you can't stop going to the store, going to pick up your medicine, going to the doctor, what, going, you know, whatever the particulars are. You just can't stop living. Whereas HIV, um, you know, it, it's, not as it's not as easy to transmit. Correct. Specifically, as long as the individual has um, kept his um, viral load undetected, it's not transmissible. Right. You equal you, that thing. You equals you. Yes. I don't know. The, explain that to me. I'm undetectable sorry. equals undetectable. Ah. So, so, um, right, 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 right. Uh, and, and staying in contact with your healthcare provider helps you make Co sure. Correct. Um, yes. That you stay undetectable. Yes. Um, so what kind of wisdom do you think you, you have as, as a, you know, based on your experience as a gay black man with HIV um, that, you know, that, that could, could, have, could um, influence the, the approach that, that, you know, that the experts take or that the, the government takes to, um, I mean, we, we're about to have uh, a new presidential administration um, and, and potentially a new approach to this pandemic. Um, what do you think has, is missing from the public conversation that, before we came on here, you talked about being a, a long-term survivor and I'm just, I'm, I'm curious um, what you feel like you've learned from that experience. Well, you, you still carry your routine protecting yourself regardless of what the situation is. It's just this particular disease is not really enough info to really say pinpoint, oh, I know I need to stay away from this. I need to stay away from that because it is too many if ands that lead you to almost anxiety. Because I'll say for myself, a couple of weeks ago, I just, I, I helped my um, mother <clears throat> go to the doctor, my brother go to the doctor. And I was one day in the hospital waiting for him after an operation. And I'm sitting there, I say, oh my God, I'm in the midst of all this chaos. I could get infected even though I'm wearing my mask, I'm using my hand sanitizer. You, there's still no uh, real protection from it. Even my uh, primary doctor just told me he, he, he increased certain uh, vitamins for me um, to help 
keep my immune system up. And he said he survived uh, the, uh, the coronavirus. So he just used the same practice that he did for himself with me. And he said, even if you get the coronavirus, it won't be as severe. As long as you're wearing your mask, you're doing whatever, you'll be able to weather it. Yes. That's reassuring, um, for sure. Um, I wanted to ask about the ballroom community. And... <clears throat> well, the ballroom community in Newark is not as prevalent as it used to be. Um, the, ven the venues are too expensive. Um, then it's, you know, it's not always conducive to the time they need to start and finish. It's problematic in Newark. So a lot, most of the ballroom, the ball stuff is actually in New York and it travels around the United States and even across the waters. You know, and it's a whole new bunch of young kids doing phenomenal things and um, brought out a lot of the transgender issues. Several of them is from the ballroom community. Dominique, um, uh, I forget her last name, but she plays on poles and she's on. Um, Rodriguez. Yeah, she's from North MJ. too. Uh, I'm talking about the tall, slender, uh, black child. Oh. Yeah, that's Dominique. She's from New York, but she was coming to the balls in Newark back oh. then. Yes. Because we chatted online one day, and I said, do you remember me? I remember when you walked against Coco and da da da, da. She said, oh, you took me back. She <laughs> remembered. She remembered, you know. What were the, um, how did, how was the ballroom scene affected by, by AIDS? I would say, um, it's kind of like if you get a cold, it ain't too much about it. They, um, if somebody get infected today, they, um, actually get them to the proper things, going to the doctor, getting medication, whatever the particulars are. It's a, it's a different realm today. They're more dealing with now, uh, the younger ones, methamphetamine. Um, uh, a lot of the young kids do that and they get into sex work and escorting and just a lot of craziness with, within that component of the balls but other parts are doing great things around the nation what about what about back in the day though i mean back the in the day it, um even though hiv and aids was rampant there's quite a few who we lost um during that time, like Ira Aphrodite, um, Angel Claudio, just to name a few, um, it's so many more. Patty Pendavis LaBelle, um, Portia, uh, Fasachi, Corinne, it's so many names of people who have passed on good people in the ballroom scene for North, but um, it isn't as prevalent as it was back then. People, even though we may have been in separate houses, we were still family, regardless if we competed in a particular category or not. We helped one another get ready for the ball, even though they may be the competition. It was more family oriented. Today's ballroom scene is not as close as we were back then. Interesting. That I, I, noticed, I noticed with them. Um. Talk, what was your house? The House of Divine. I um, started the House of Divine after um, Patty um, and Davis LaBelle had passed. And because um, before that, I was going to try to be the mother of the House of LaBelle. But she said, no, when she died, let it die. And I said, OK. And I started my own house. And we, we was doing good because mostly what I was teaching my kids about having fun, having integrity, don't get caught up in the negative aspect of any of it. It's just a trophy. It's just a category. You 
put your best foot forward and keep it moving. Because most of us was working after the ball. You know, we had to go to work the next day. So we couldn't get into all the um, underling stuff that uh, goes on or went on back then. Um, great. Uh, what have I, what have we not talked about that you want to be sure um, to say something about uh, with respect to African-American AIDS awareness in 2021? As a long-term survivor, um, gay black male, community activist, poet, it's not the end because you have HIV or AIDS. It's not the end because I'm your friend. I'm still here 41 years later, still doing better somewhat and helping other people. It's about each one teach one, pass it on from family to friend and so on and so on. And then before you know it, everybody's educated on HIV and AIDS. Amazing. Thank you so, so much. Um, this was great. Hear this. You are worthy and you are enough. If you are living with HIV, you are worthy of love. Self-love, romantic love, communal love. But if you have judged, if you have shamed, if you have put up a red door in front of someone who deserved so much more, you too are worthy. Worthy of learning how to love even when you are afraid and accept even when you don't understand. We have the treatments, the medicines to end the HIV epidemic among gay and queer Black men. What we don't always have is others' commitments to love us, to lift us up, to see us, to affirm us so that we know we are valued, so that our families, our churches, our communities, and our neighborhoods become spaces that protect us and support us in caring for ourselves. That is the medicine that we also need. One that takes away stigma. One that each of us has the power to give.